distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. I am pleased to be addressing you on the third day of the World Climate Summit, representing my country, the state of Qatar. This is an excellent platform to share core climate concerns and goals during the 2017 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP23, with the aim of the encouraging countries toward the next level to tackle global warming and put the world on a safer and richer development path. It comes only two years after adoption of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, which has given momentum in support of national climate action plans and the wider objective of, two, of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable. For sustainable development, including, course, including of course, our topic of concern for today and every day, namely water. Globally, the picture is bleak. According to the Global Water Institute report 2016, water scarcity affects around 2.8 billion people around the world at least one month every year. More than 1.2 billion people lack access to clean drinking water and around 700 million people in 43 countries suffer from water scarcity. By 2025, two thirds of the world's population may be facing water shortages. In addition, demand for water will exceed supply by 40% by 2030 with the existing climate change scenario. But what went wrong here? It is the way we use water. We extract it, treat it at high cost, use it, then discharge it. This could be described as a linear process, which economic economically and environmentally unsustainable. The better approach is to circulate water in closed loops. In this model, water is reused many times to benefit from its full value. This is an example of what we refer to as a circular economy. Distinguished guests, an important question is why should we transit, why we should transit to water circular economy? The answer, for many reasons, among which global urban population is growing fast, resulting in increase in water demand at 2% annually. Also, the way, the way water is currently used is often ineffective. For example, agriculture accounts for 70% of global freshwater consumption, yet only 40% of it reaches plants. Another reason is that we have no excuse to waste due to, to the new technologies available. They enable us to manage water more effectively. Last but not least, we cannot ignore the regulatory pressures from United Nations to improve water quality and, and substantially increase safe recycling and reuse. These reasons are coupled with a bearing of new business models enabling us to make a profit out of the wastewater, such as a bio refineries and fertilizer factories. Now posing this issue to, uh, to you, the question in your mind should be, how about you? Do you apply circular economy in the state of Qatar? Before we go to that, let me first introduce you to some facts about my home country, Qatar. Qatar, Qatar is one of the world's fastest growing economy as measured by GDP per capita. But it falls in a red region in the Middle East with an average rainfall of 80 millimeter, millimeter per year. Hence, Qatar is among the countries which physically water scarcity. Okay, this is the right, uh, I think. Uh, hmm? Okay. Ah, it's not moving, huh? Okay. Sorry, because the presentation is not moving in the screen, so you could not see it. Anyhow. As per Qatar National Vision 2030 launched under his Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad, the Amir of the State of Qatar, preserving natural resources is core to achieve comprehensive sustainable development through four pillars of development, economic, environmental, human, and social. And a very scarce resource in Qatar is water. 
Over 99% of, of it comes from desalination of seawater, and we are using the gas, natural gas, to desalinate water, and the rest from overused aquifers. As such, Qatar has launched a water policy and a strategy based on the three principles of circular economy, an integrated approach to managing water life cycle, adopting a no-waste mandate, and planning every state of the water life cycle. The first step in this strategy is decreasing water losses. A circular, as a circular water cycle requires re reduction in waste, one important method is reducing in water leakage. It is estimated around the world to run at 20% up to 40%. Qatar, in turn, has worked hard to reduce its non-revenue water to 10% with network losses at approximately 6% only, among the lowest in the world. And this by using the latest technology in the market, such as smart wall. The second step has been applying system thinking. Water resources management is approached with a comprehensive look from production to, cost to consumer efficient use. This started in Qatar with the advancement of the National Program for Conservation and Energy Efficiency, we call it Tarshid. It is built on the following pyramid, laws and tariff, technology, technologies and the standardization of equipment, and the promoting of awareness among community, community. And I do invite all of you to visit our both outside, which will give you more details about this uh, conservation program of State of Qatar. As such, we succeed to bring down per capita consumption of water by almost 20% from 2012 to 2016, and to bring down CO2 emission by 8.4 million tons during the same period and 1 million US dollar money saving. The third step is applying no waste concept. A producer of, a concept a producer of water, like my organization, which we call it Kahrama, and its partner, are key players in the move towards circular economy. We work together to design and align our process to ensure waste eradication and reuse as the primary drivers of water sector in Qatar. Currently, we are using recycled wa water for district cooling. This has both implications for the water used as well as the energy consumed, saving almost 60% of potable water used and about 10 million US dollar annually. The fourth step is applying closed loop systems. 70% of agriculture water went to fodder before 2016. Now we stop this using TSE, treated sewage water. By law, as potable water costs more money than buying fodder in Qatar. Also, TSE irrigation is in public parks. It's currently applied in almost 25% of public parks in Qatar resulting in decreasing 10% of, uh, of their total potable water consumption that went for irrigation annually. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, to wrap up my words with, I would like to mention a few points in relation to accelerating circular, circular water economy. By the adoption of an integrated water resources management approach and engagement of all stakeholders, we can accelerate the base of water circular economy. This should be coupled by balancing demand and supply, and supply in a, enabled uh, digital platforms. The economy can also be accelerated through sustained effort to utilize every drop of water by replacing potable water with recycled water where possible. To conclude, Moving to circular economy of water is about optimizing natural water cycles rather than shifting to new domains. And as said in the 2017 Circular Economy Forum, repairing is part of the DNA of developing countries. Hence, applying circular economy principle base, bases and finding repair solutions such as system thinking, closed loop systems, and retention of value we can possibly prevent the water crisis that may predict and secure an abundant, resilient, and renewable water future. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and wish you success in all your effort in saving our valuable resource water. We are all doing well, but we can do more through fostering innovation thinking and behavior. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency, for the fascinating keynote. I would now like to invite to the stage moderator Nicolas Imbert, CEO of Green Cross France and distinguished panelists for session one, Water in the Circular Economy, Industry-Driven Solutions to Consumption and Waste. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you for coming this morning. And I'm specifically grateful to uh, uh, Excellence uh, Esa Binello, like Wani, uh, from the Qatar General Electricity and the Water uh, Corporation for this uh, keynote speech. Because uh, as you understood, climate change is accelerating now. And here at the World Climate Summit, we are there to propose tangible and effective solutions. Today's panel is about circular economy and water. And this is of key importance because of increasing water scarcity, because of the pollution questions, and because of the different extreme events that may happen due to climate change. And this place is a key area for impact innovation, and we know that impact innovation, whether coming from economic leaders or coming from startup companies or coming to NGOs, sometimes uh, it may uh, happen as well, is not as promoted yet as it could be. So this is where it's very important that such panels are taking place. And I will now call from the different distinguished panelists. And here in the room, we have Miss Stella Thomas. So Miss Stella Thomas, uh, please come. You are the founder and managing director of the Global Water Fund. This is a group based in Switzerland. It aims navigating water strategy for the business and investment community. And it serves as a platform for stakeholders such as global governments, United Nations, to address the global problem of natural resources management. It mobilizes finance tools and new technologies for investment and partnership into national economies. Then there is Mr. Jesper Daugard. Please come in. And you are senior vice president of CAMSOP Group. Kamsoup is an innovation leader with the areas of intelligent metric and IoT solutions. And uh, today, mm, we know that one third of ultrasonic smart water meters are delivered by Kamsoup in the world. And uh, you orchestrate the strategic vision for branding, marketing, and PR through the different uh, Kamsoup businesses in 24 countries. And uh, you have a deep understanding, of course, of Kamsoup solutions of customer trends, and on top of this, of the challenges that are facing both the technologies, water utilities, it cooling industries. Then I'm very pleased to welcome as well uh, Cecile Decauer. Cecile is there. So your lawyer, your advisor for SMEs and startups in Asia, you've been CEO of uh, LG France and 4E, a consultancy which was dedicated to renewable energy, and now you are supporting legal and development issues in Asia for WICO, and you'll tell us a bit later on what WICO is, but you have a flush toilet mechanicism who are recycling wastewaters to produce simultaneously clean water, fertilizer, or fuel. And maybe that Paul is there, so I'm very pleased to welcome as well uh, Paul Altus. You are CEO of uh, the World Ocean Country. Hi, Paul. And uh, the World Ocean Council has been launched in 2008 as a non-profit organization to advance industry leadership and collaboration in ocean sustainable development. Your US and UK registered, your board of directors has many senior industry representatives from around the world, and 
every year you're organizing a sustainable ocean summit. Next edition will be the fifth one. It will be focused on SDG 14 and it will take place in Halifax from November the 29th to December the 1st. So I'm very pleased and honored that we had this kind of distinguished pa panelists to work out uh, the topic. Mr. Keynote Speaker, should you want at any time to come to discuss or to add anything, please feel free uh, to do so. And now let's open the panel. <laughs> to, to open this panel, my first question will be for Ms. Stella Thomas, because uh, <coughs> you as uh, the Global Fund uh, CEO has an extensive experience on the different stakeholders and concerns about the circular economy and water. And what is, from your perspective, the key point we should t take care of when dealing with circular economy, when dealing with water in the context of climate change? Thank you, Nicola. Can you hear me? Better? Not so much. Can you hear me? No? No, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, well, thank you to Nicola and thank you to the organizers for organizing this excellent uh, summit the last couple of days. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is water, I'm just going to hold it, <laughs> water, not energy, is the biggest threat facing the 21st century. And, um, you know, water weaves its web through our economy, through energy, through food, through human and national security, through health. And what um, we need to look at, as uh, His Excellency from Qatar mentioned earlier, is we have, first of all, about four billion people right now today who are already being affected by water stress or water scarcity. Population growth right now, um, we're looking at a world tw in 2030 going from 8.5 billion to some 10 billion. So, and most of this growth is happening in countries where already there is a lot of water scarcity. In the Middle East, population is doubling by in every 22 years. And a lot of this growth is also coming online from India and from China, where um, higher uh, levels of income also bring higher consumption levels and higher food, uh, more, more water-intensive food, and so forth. Then, of course, we have, uh, so then we have shifts in, in demographics. Most of the growth is happening in these countries. The, the, the 17 of the fastest growing cities with 10 million or over are in the emerging markets. So uh, then we look at uh, uh, urbanization. 65 to 75% of, of us will be living in cities, and that means that new slums are, are raising up the same time that these new cities are coming on board, and that also means new infrastructure, new sanitation, and new water systems in place. And then, of course, we need to look at pollution, which kills or affects about three million people a year. We have to look at climate change, which is highly regulated by uh, oceans and all kinds of other climatic conditions and energy inputs and so forth. These things you know. Um, so what we're looking at right now is a world of exponential growth, a world where we need 50% more water, we need 40% more energy, and we need 55% more food by 2030. So we can no longer live in a world of linear business models, and we really need to look at a circular world. Um, and, and when we talk about circular world, it's commonly, um, you know, our, co our common linear way of looking at things is to make, to take, to dispose the pollution back into the environment. And, um, and if we no longer can use that, we just go somewhere else, as has happened to many uh, countries in the past where there was so much water pollution, there was not enough for agriculture and there wasn't enough for um, other um, uh, development. We'll talk about that in a minute, but Nicola is um, allowing me to indulge a few more minutes. Um, a few comments from the last session I'd like to make because I thought your questions were excellent. The elephant in the room here, and especially because we're here at the UN Climate Summit, is that we are not being disruptive enough. There's a lot of money out there, the pension funds, the investment community, a lot of money looking for a place to go. 
The technical know-how is out there. There's a lot of great examples of emerging technologies. The problem is the regulation. It's the political will. But there is also political will. How do we be disruptive? The first thing we need to do is we have to take a systemic look at our water, food, energy systems. We need to monitor and measure that. Two in five people live on shared river basins. So if one country is developing upstream energy, how is it affecting our water downstream? So we need to use digital technologies where we bring artificial intelligence, we map out these, uh, these uh, systems, and then we can create forecasting models. And then from there, we can make better policy, investment, and also um, knowledge about these situations. So it's awareness, it's knowledge, and we need to bring together technology, compassionate capital, and transformational leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. It was a very good, consistent uh, introduction, raising uh, the different topics and specifically the fact that we have to need urgently with respect to something that deals with human health, that deals with well-being, that deals uh, also with keeping a safe environment. But we are not so sure about this pollution because it's a bit difficult to see what's happening. And it comes back uh, to uh, what we were saying with Mr. Jesper Daubag, you're often saying that we don't act on waste, we don't on sea. So this is specifically true in the field of uh, water. And how can we deal with this? Well, I think especially in, in the water supply, water is, you can say, delivered to the consumers in pipes. These pipes are normally below the ground, and we do not see what's going on below the ground. So as long as we cannot see it, we often do not react on it. And that's the reason why I have three glasses of tap water here. We are talking about water scarcity, yet in very many places around the world, if we need one glass of tap water, actually we will produce three. And the two glasses here is the amount of tap water that is wasted before it receives the consumer. So that's the amount of waste that is in the pipe. So you can say the circle of water is sometimes a bit too short because it doesn't reach the consumer before it's back in the ground. Um, what, what is possible is that actually through digitalization, we can actually start to see what's going on in the pipes. Uh, we can basically get enough data to analyze to see if there's anything that is, you could say, not according to our theory. So if reality is different from theory, then something is wrong. And that enables us to detect what is the cause of non-revenue water or what is the cause of the waste. And we can be more dedicated to react on this waste. In many areas of the world where we have a high level of water waste is also where you have difficulties to finance a new water infrastructure. And if you want to replace the complete infrastructure because you know the, the level of waste is too high, then you're looking at a financial burden that is simply too high. In many situations, it's not 100% of the infrastructure that is a problem. It is specific areas where you need to replace that. And to direct your investment, especially in those areas where you have the best return, is also what we need to stop the biggest holes first. And, and that, that's basically one of the solutions or one of the possibilities that we can react on. It was mentioned that 2.8 billion people are without water supply in at least one month during the year. Actually, we know that the complete waste of water that we know about is enough to supply 400 million people with water. So it's not the whole solution, but it's definitely a very important part of the solution. Thank you very much for these perspectives. And it comes back to uh, the startup activities of uh, Miss Cecile Lecoeur, because uh, your technology are transforming wastewater in clean water and fuel and fertilizer. So this is really a straight, very close loop circular economy at the scale of uh, the loo, of the toilets. How is it to achieve? Is it easy? What are the difficulties you're facing? What is uh, your business plan and forecasting? Well, I think nothing is easy, and especially when you talk about excrements or toilets. Uh, it's something uh, that is um, it's a very important topic. More than 3 billion people lack of proper sanitation. Children are dying of diarrhea. Uh, young women and women are being raped uh, in India when they do not have uh, sanitation. So lots of issues. We have uh, different issues uh, in emerging countries 
there is no sanitation or no sewer network. In developed countries, you have uh, an issue of wasted water. You have billion, billions of clean water wasted into the flush. So uh, that's how I came with the idea of uh, creating an innovating, innovative sanitation system. And I looked at the existing technology at that time. Uh, hopefully, I was lucky because uh, the Bill and Medida Gates Foundation uh, started to involve in this uh, sanitation uh, issue uh, five years ago, and they have financed lots of uh, technology and R&D programs. And we, we decided to go on with uh, uh, California University of Technology, which developed um, an electrolysis uh, technology transforming the urine into clean water. So we will use this uh, clean water to um, domestic use that is allowed. For example, in EU, you don't have many possibilities. Uh, so we, we eva evaporate them with the vegetal roof. But in a, a developing world, we can reuse this water more easily. Regulation is not such a big issue. So uh, we, have, uh, we have been facing lots of problems because it's a concern for everyone. We, spot, we spend an average of four years of our life on the toilets, but there is no, uh, it, it, it was like if nobody was really considering that it is, uh, it is important. You know, the UN development goals, number six is water and sanitation. So uh, we, we, are, we are trying very hard to uh, address all of very different issues. Solutions are different in each country, but uh, the, the need is the same. So, and it's great to see, uh, to see that people are welcoming our technology, are very curious about our technology. So I would say it was hard to start, it's still hard, because for example, uh, as you said, financing is very difficult to get. But uh, what is good is, is the, I would say, the people, the market, and uh, the interest we, we have and we receive, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great motivation for us. I just would like to add on 19, 19 of November in three days, it's the World Toilet Days, UN World Toilet Days, so uh, it's an opportunity to discuss and advocate for better sanitation. And there is also uh, an ISO uh, standardization coming in which I am deeply involved for uh, non steward sanitation system. So everything is, um, uh, the stars are aligned, but uh, we need still uh, to work hard. Now I know on a personal basis uh, where I'm spending five years on my life and thank you very much for this precision in anticipation of a World Water Day. So let's move to a completely different topic. Mr. Paul Altus, uh, the main focus of WOC is the ocean, the global ocean, but uh, as it's often stated and specifically by our closing remark panelist from Michel Cousteau, there is only one water cycle. This water cycle is the same from water and water drop down to uh, the ocean. And I know that uh, the World Ocean Council engagement in terms of circular economy and water are quite important. And there has been as part of COP23 link with SDG 14, some engagement about ocean leaders with respect to uh, climate. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Nicola. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, um, thank you to the organizers for inviting us. Um, and first, I'd like to say uh, it's great to be on a, a, a very gender balanced uh, panel. It's really uh, an honor to share the stage with, with, with mm -hmm. leadership from across the, uh, across the entire spectrum. So that's his uh, progress as well. So. And I'm uh, building on what yes we did here. So let's let's think about the ocean in terms of the fresh water and the amount of water in the ocean. So being uh, more than 71% uh, uh, coverage of the planet. So as we agreed, will the ocean coverage of, in our panel will be 71% of the time, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, Almost oh, not. No. <laughs> but seriously, uh, to to think about these uh, uh, these issues as they connect up, and and we work with the um, with the ocean industries of the world to look at a more holistic, uh, comprehensive approach to dealing with the, the ocean change and the ocean challenges and the ocean uh, opportunities for uh, responsible business and sustainable development and providing the goods and, and, and services that, that the entire planet uh, depends upon from a variety of, of sectors. So maritime transport, uh, uh, energy, both uh, fossil fuel and increasingly uh, renewable, uh, food for the food security issues that comes from fisheries and, and uh, aquaculture, 
and a whole range of other uh, goods and services. But that uh, this 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 water planet is all connected up. Uh, it's one it's one global water cycle, and so as part of what we do um, uh, increasingly is is linking these ocean industries and the ocean ocean uh, business community, as we call it, and the ocean economy with the land-based water uh, economy, and particularly uh, developing uh, a, a sort of a source-to-sea approach to really dealing with these issues and then linking that, that approach to uh, the climate change uh, situation and, and the imperative to uh, address the, the impacts and the, uh, the changes to the water cycle and to the, to the ocean that, that are coming with climate change. In this, in this source-to-sea approach, really linking from the, the catchments through to the ocean, uh, and, and, and that it has kind of been a kind of a linear s set of circumstances where what's happening on land is coming through the watersheds, through the, uh, the streams and rivers to the ocean, but we need to, we need to bring that circle closed in terms of where these, these linked industries can, can collaborate to address some of, these, some of these challenges. And so that's really um, the focus of this source to sea effort, to bring the, the water, uh, the fresh water industry, the sector uh, that, that really uh, mobilizes and, and develops the technology and, and the industry of bringing fresh water to, uh, to humanity, linking that then with the, the land use uh, and resource use uh, community that is affecting the quality of that water. So the, the agriculture industry in particular and the fertilizer industry uh, that, that uh, has, of course, impacts on those water courses and to and there's a lot of great work uh, going on to understand how to reduce that impact and those inputs to the water system that, of course, end up in our world, in the ocean world, um, as well the, the resources and, and consumables uh, part of the, uh, of, of the global economy in that we have uh, the, other, the other kinds of things that end up as waste in our society that end up, again, in the water courses and out, and out in the ocean, and, and as all of you have been hearing about the last number of years, uh, particularly the plastics issue. And so engaging the plastics industry and the, and the chemical industry uh, as well. And finally, as, as partners in this, in this source to see this, this, this whole water cycle approach, uh, the waste management industry, uh, the, uh, the, the great uh, companies and, and, and um, innovators, and, and you know, we need a lot of innovation and technology development to deal with waste management at the scale and of the, the sources uh, that are being generated and, and entering into the water cycle and ending up in the ocean. So we need to, to have the, the economical, the, the appropriate, scalable technologies. And sometimes this is big infrastructure. Sometimes it's, it's uh, locally scaled uh, innovations and, and uh, technology that's needed to really address those wastes close to the source and certainly from our perspective wanting to help, wanting to prevent them getting into the water courses and, get, and prevent them from ending up uh, in the ocean. Uh, where it becomes a much more difficult, diffuse uh, problem in terms of trying to uh, clean up and keep the ocean healthy and clean and productive. For example, for food uh, through aquaculture and other, and other means that, that uh, societies and communities need, or healthy fisheries from local communities all the way up to global scale um, uh, food production. Uh, and as a part of that, I'd also mention directly related to the water needs of society is, is the growth, and particularly in, in the Middle East, and and increasing the other areas of desalination. So again, we need clean marine waters to help provide good fresh water uh, to growing populations in, in these uh, booming uh, coastal cities. Uh, so linking all of that together from a business perspective, that's the focus of the World Ocean Council. And uh, um, uh, you know, I think this kind of event and, and how to link that to then uh, climate change and the changes in the water cycle, the changes in the ocean that are creating additional challenges is really, uh, is really valuable and so really happy to be a part of this sort of water cycle discussion here because we're too often thinking about fresh water and the land and the ocean as, as different entities, but water, water connects us. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for making a very good transition to the question of innovation, business models, and uh, business uh, opportunities. Because uh, you were talking about the kind of innovation that we should have in the uh, scope of water, some being very big, and it's important to have this big innovation, some being very small or scattered or scalable, and uh, it's also very important to fertilize this a bit more difficult to go through innovation and 
the main question that has been raised uh, as well uh, by, uh, sorry, uh, Jesper Hogard is the question of profitability because it may be the case that the people who need an innovation to come are not willing to, are not ready to, or are not able to uh, pay. And it comes back also uh, to uh, the point of Stella, not forgetting that we are not only talking about innovation for the Western world, but we're also talking with four uh, billion people for whilst water is a key uh, problem on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm really happy and honored to thank you, the people from Qatar, for the introduction. They had to leave earlier, but uh, they live in a country where water square city is of uh, key importance. And so my question to you all in the panelists is, how can we make sure, can we evolve in our innovation driven techniques and in our business model to produce good innovations that meet human needs and that are profitable from the first beginning to the end? If, if, if I could start on that one, because I, I think that's exactly the challenge. When we look at the Western Europe and US, we have seen digitalization starting because you could basically save labor costs and salaries were high, so it was easy to get started. And in areas with high water scarcity, you don't have that, you can say, initiator to, to start the, uh, the development. However, if you think about the cost of producing two glasses of water that is wasted, everybody, every time somebody needs one glass of water, that is bringing operational cost that is financed by consumers and governments in those countries today. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it over a five or 10 years horizon, actually to innovate and to uh, digitalize these areas is a very good business case. Uh, we have seen a project in, in Ghana where the World Bank sponsored this project and basically the message from the World Bank is when you get your money returned from that project, you don't have to pay us, you can actually start on, on, uh, on the next phase. And I would just say, when we're talking about optimizing water waste in Europe, uh, we're talking one digit percentage from 10% to 5% water waste. <laughs> and, and, and we are talking returns on investments within years. Actually, when you're talking about reducing water waste from 60 to 30%, you're talking return on, on investment in month. So it's, it's a very good investment. Uh, we just have to find out that you can say, how do we start something where the waste is invisible? We don't see it, so we don't accept it. And I mm -hmm. think that's the biggest challenge. That's the, the starting point we need to face. And so it comes back to uh, Stella as an investor. What do you think? Um, well, the investment community is very eager to invest in this area. However, because water is not transparent and there's no governance around it, it's, uh, the information is not out there. Um, the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to value water properly. Water and energy is subsidized, and this is the fundamental problem, it's too cheap. So how are you to encourage investment in this field, and especially wastewater, if we're talking about a circular economy, which will save about you know, half of the water we need, but you know, sewage water will be even cheaper than regular water. So first of all, we have to, that, have, to have that com conversation about uh, pricing. We have to look at uh, tariffs, taxes, uh, pollution permits, and so forth. So th this is a, a very important thing. Now, the business community is already creating closed loop cycles and they've taken it upon themselves. Um, endless examples, Unilever paying uh, farmers in uh, France, central France, to be organic in order to produce, uh, to um, preserve their water supply. You have P&G in China, you have Nestle, you have L'Oreal. There's endless examples where there's closed loop cycles because businesses um, needed that uh, license to operate it. They needed the security and the stability and the water source. Um, but what's happening now, and, 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 and what they've done now is they're also securing the ecological systems around that. But because there's so many competing interests now, um, because of these shared river basins, um, and because of the scarcity that and, and the population growth, this now needs to be escalated to another level. And it's no longer enough to have businesses take the responsibility. It has to, you know, government has to work together 
with all shareholders, including the business and investor community. And just to give you an example, municipality in Sweden um, uh, 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 extracted phosphorus, um, which was an, uh, a really you know, important and expensive uh, nutrient, nutrient and phosphorus, which we need. And unfortunately, they had some problems um, because the regulation wasn't there. So government needs to provide that regulation. Switzerland, Japan, uh, Scandinavia, there are very good examples, but for the developing world, how do we get that money in there? So the government community needs to talk about the legislations, the permitting, the tax. The business community has, has that know-how, and it's just bringing this all together and then having the information there. We need, we need information. We need, need to know how to monitor this. Yeah. Very interesting, and it deals uh, with what Cecile uh, was saying, because on one side, we need more different, updated, and uh, probably uh, scalable uh, regulation. And on the other side, Celine, Cecile was uh, stating that with respect to the use of wastewater, it was quite difficult to innovate in Europe, and it might be easier to innovate in a even in a pollution-friendly manner in Africa or in different countries. So please uh, elaborate. Exactly, thank you. Uh, what I wanted to add as an innovator, uh, as we so call, um, if, I have an ad, if I have a recommendation, is that we have to make it simple and affordable. I have seen many, many uh, IT or well, all, all kind of companies innovating, very interesting, but nobody understand exactly what they are doing, what they use. Water and sanitation is such a big issue, it's frightening everybody. So since it's frightening everybody, nobody is taking care and nobody is trying. For example, if you talk about urbanization in Africa, sanitation is a huge, huge issue in, in Nigeria, for example. So we have some uh, projects in rural area, but it's, it's hardly scalable. So we have to think of solutions, innovation, because all all um, matters are worth innovating, and again, toilets are worth innovating. Uh, but um, we have to, to, to make it um, uh, easily understandable and attractive to, to people in order to, to, to have the people involved and wanting to work with you and wanting to share. We are transforming urine into clean water. We are reusing this clean water for flushing, but we have an additional amount of water to use. So we have to make a partnership or project with other local uh, partners that are interested in uh, having this clean water. As you said, in, in developed countries, it's really difficult because of the regulation. And there is a kind of joke that I, I am saying. I say, people ask me, well, you are a lawyer. Why are you, why are you walking into toilets? I say, but how could we make toilets if we are not lawyer? Because regulations are so uh, such a big hurdle that uh, we, it's really hard to understand the whole ecosystem. So if we have to share those kind of uh, uh, resources, such as water, to find innovation to share these resources and uh, to, f to adapt it to each local circum circumstances. So that's a very good transition to uh, Paul because uh, you already told us about the communities that are all thinking in their own interest. But at the end, this is the ocean who is collecting the wall uh, water uh, pollution. And in the meantime, we know how difficult it might be uh, for fishing or for tourism you know, to cope with this situation. Yeah, and that, you know, this is really. Uh, uh, what uh, the part of the uh, the uh, dynamics here in in our engaging of the the, the land-based uh, industries and the land-based uh, water uh, water sector uh, and waste management sector is that uh, those industries have been uh, kind of looking at, at at their domain with their back to the ocean thinking oh, we have to figure out how to manage this water and manage the waste uh, flow into the water systems and meanwhile behind them in the ocean is where so much of this is ending up, and so we're, we're wanting to help get people thinking uh, about that relationship to what happens on land in the, in the catchments and in the water systems, and how that affects uh, that marine system, both at a, at a local and a community level and their resources and livelihoods, but all the way up to sort of uh, national and, and, and regional level um, uh, dynamics in terms of uh, productivity and, and health, of that, health of that ecosystem. But to focus on, I think, the, uh, some of the, uh, really particularly the uh, opportunities to link up that, that land and marine, that land and marine uh, integrated water system, uh, and also uh, particularly around financing, uh, 
in this in this these source to see discussions that are going on, we're really looking at how to create uh, the ap application and incentivize the technology and, and apply that technology to waste capture and waste treatment uh, by thinking about where these where these where this land based uh, catchment comes through a river uh, to the coast, and then there's that whole marine ecosystem that it connects to, and a lot of that that the narrow part of that of that uh, intersection is at these cities, and some of them are huge cities, but uh, the vast majority of humanity, as was, was pointed out, is living in urban areas. The vast majority of those urban areas are coastal. And so to think about where the economies of scale are, to link that waste, that waste management need from that land-based catchment as it comes into that, that coastal city through the water courses, and where it links into the port, where all of these maritime industries come to shore, be it shipping, fishing, cruise tourism, and others, they have waste streams that are generated on those vessels that are highly regulated, uh, particularly for, for international shipping through, for example, the UN uh, International Maritime Organization. Those industries, they need the uh, what's called in the international regulations adequate port reception facilities to discharge those waste streams. Those coastal cities, and many of them are, are medium sized and they're growing rapidly in Asia and Africa in particular, they need the waste management, the waste collection and treatment and, and management systems. And so if you start to put those two sets of sources from the land and from the sea together, you start to get the economies of scale and the need for infrastructure and therefore the need for investment. And so we're dealing a lot with the, the long-term infrastructure interested investment community, the pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds, and really uh, working to create a, a sense of investment opportunity to deal with these joint marine and land issues of, of waste management, uh, treatment and collection. Uh, and really uh, create uh, viable, uh, bankable uh, uh, projects to, 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 to handle this, this shared marine and, and terrestrial freshwater prob problem. You wanted to react on this, I suppose? Yeah, I, I want, want also to, to, to react on the innovation in, in Africa and other places in the world. Uh, what we see, in, in, you can say, in terms of securing that we get financing for this area, one thing is to secure the revenue stream. I think that's very important. And, and that is where we have seen, especially Africa, actually jumping a technology step. So, so technology developed that actually allows prepayment of water uh, is actually something that is driven, driven by need in Africa. Um, so, so that is a lo solution where people are able to say, OK, I want to spend this amount of money on water. And, and the valves open, and they can get their water. And when the water is used, the valve closes or when the money is used. So that, that is a technology that will jump back to Europe at, at one point of time. Uh, so I think innovation happens there, but we have to secure that there's a revenue stream. There is also the, in, in, when we're talking about water, there is what is the total cost of water? Because there is cleaning the water and delivering the water. But then there's also maintaining the infrastructure. Then it's also getting rid of the dirty water. So there's a lot of cost. The Danish solution on that is actually to put heavy tax on water. Mm -hmm. So that is by legislation and regulation, and you solve that. If you go to Sao Paulo, uh, they have also the view that water is a human right. So if they just take the Danish model and put a high taxation on water, a huge amount of people would have a really big problem. So what they have done also to address scarcity is they say for a family, the first 10,000 liter per month mm -hmm. is at a level where everybody can afford it. If you use 10,001 liter, every single liter is fa invoiced at a very high price. And, and this, is, this is the kind of intelligence systems that governments and, and regulators need to establish to make sure that water utilities can actually embrace the total cost of managing water in the best possible way. If you don't do that, you end up spending more money in expensive operations. Yeah. And yeah, last year, indeed, the COP22 in Marrakech was really interesting because uh, Morocco has this regulation on water with a special tariff. And uh, we've seen through the villages and specifically uh, through uh, what was called uh, green and blue uh, zones, th that people's involvement with respect to water concern was great. Even if this is a question to you, it may be the case that people's education on what is the impact of their activities in water is not so well understood uh, at this point of time. So how do you think we could make people involvement 
greater and I would say more in the scope of uh, general interest and uh, what is the way to have the general interest and the specific interest of the companies coming to a single SDG 6 goal. Thank you. Um, just coming on to some of these comments as well, um, a dollar invested in water yields um, up to $35 return, but in wastewater it's about $5, so it does make sense um, in general. Um, what we need to understand is looking at water as part of water management. Water management, when done properly invested, can raise a country's GDP on average by 3.7%. So this is very important to note. And if we look at it from um, how it looks at economy, and then also what we need to look at treating at the source. So um, for example, in uh, Zurich, um, they, they link up their um, micro um, anaerobic digestion uh, in order to extract the biogas or electricity with combustion of steam and heat. And so you're able to take any of that waste out. And then also, it's also mandated that phosphorus needs to come out as well. So, so it doesn't end up back into the, the bigger water cycle. And this is very important. And we have to really focus on these kinds of, these linked up technologies where we're looking at traditional water management <laughs> with sewage uh, water management and um, and in that way we can make some progress because right now only 20 percent of the world's waste is treated, 20%. So there's really great examples. If we were to look at examples, I'm sure you know Singapore's new water, um, and they were able to do that where they turned wastewater into drinkable water. Myself, I had a bit of difficulty drinking it at first, but once you get over that yuck factor, you, it makes sense, you know? And so there's a lot of um, ways to look at it. Of course, it has to be marketing. And, uh, even Saudi Arabia, who they've exploited, they've been, you know, 85% of uh, Saudi Arabia had a lot of the desalination plants, but they they destroyed their oceans and they had uh, aquifer uh, salinization and, their, and, and so forth. So they actually turned to waste treatment, which is something that was a cultural uh, problem. And if Saudi Arabia was able to turn to waste treatment, um, I think the rest of the world can, can do that as well. well I, I would just add that uh, the problem we have probably um, concerning your question about how can we raise the, the interest uh, and involvement of people into this uh, um, global issue for everyone. Uh, the problem is that in developed country, countries, we don't have this feeling of uh, lacking water. And I mean, in, 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 developing, uh, in the developing world, it's a day-to-day -day issue. So when you, when you come with a solution like ours, uh, that you can see right at the entrance uh, <laughs> when you come in, uh, of course, uh, you don't need to advocate because uh, they, they fully understand the issue. But in developed countries, you have to communicate, you have to market, and you have to have the, the government involved to, 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 take, uh, to take regulations, taxes, in order for people to understand that water is not an unlimited resource. Yeah. Um. As you can see, the level of fresh water has dropped down <laughs> to 5% by the way we were talking, <laughs> Jasper. Yeah, just, just you could say, ba based on experience about how to involve consumers, because basically what we can do is we can give people a very clear picture of how do they consume water, um, and, and in that sense also inform them when they are responsible of waste. Yeah. So that, that could be actually a toilet just running over a year or, or things like that. Uh, what we see is that uh, you, could, you could, through communication and knowledge, you can influence people for a maximum three months. And then either you have changed their habit or you don't. Mm -hmm. So there's two powerful things that change habit. Either there's not enough of what I want, mm -hmm. I don't get my coffee, or money. Yeah. If things start to get very, very expensive, people start to think rational. Yeah. But this... Can I just say one thing to add to that. Come on. The other thing is um, technology. We had, uh, we did some uh, experiments about how to change behavior and we were able to install an app um, on a phone which tells myself, you and all my friends what our, our use was. And we discovered that after one month, water use dropped 30% because everybody with their smartphones was sitting around wanted to show that they had less water use than their friend. So that was a very powerful lesson for us. 
Yeah, and this could be another way of uh, dealing with the question of the mismatch between the value of water and the price of water. And then comes to the question of affordability on one side, you already talked a bit about this, and on the other side, the question of the water quality, specifically with uh, the circular economy. This is specifically something we can't see, but it's very easy to see the effects on sanitation on, and public health. So how, oh, with respect to this question, can we have a rising in the level of awareness and also in the level of involvement of uh, the communities? Paul? Well, one of the ways, and I, and I just had a nice chat with uh, the woman who's uh, head of sustainability for Kellogg, Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the big uh, food cereal producer and, and really linking, uh, so, they, so they are the c clearly a major consumer facing company and she in a totally non-water, non-ocean uh, session last week over at the Bond Zone uh, about uh, business leadership in sustainable development uh, brought up the anoxic zones, the, the, the dead zones that are, that are in the ocean and the role of agriculture as a major contributor to that, and therefore the role of a, a major consumer product company like Kellogg in needing you know, the agricultural production to produce their products, though that lead to this, this um, eutrophication and, and runoff that creates a dead zone. And so I think uh, that's the kind of, you know, connecting these water issues and, and then by extension the, the ocean uh, issues, particularly uh, in the sense of the water cycle and, and waste and, and the circular economy is really, um, there are, there are some key uh, strategic um, connecting points and levers on that. And so to have, you know, at, at some level, when, when uh, one of us buys our box of cornflakes, we may not need to, to have that, those connections in mind, but if the company that's making those cornflakes does, and they are working hard to ensure that agricultural productivity is, is circular economy minded in the sense of wanting to make sure that they are the phosphorus or whatever the nutrients are not getting into the waterway and creating a water a freshwater pollution problem and then a marine problem you know that's a key part of the awareness is is at that um, is at that corporate that b2b level um, that may you know it's not going to take care of all of the issues but certainly for some of them that's a, a big part of what uh, where the work needs to be done and it's great to have companies uh, picking that up at a corporate level just uh, two comments. One comment is on what's, what's utilities doing today. Uh, another comment was what will be possible in most likely three years from now. Um, a lot of water utilities actually take the wastewater because there's a lot of energy in that. And they use that to generate electricity. And in that way, first of all, they become energy neutral because they're taking the energy out of the wastewater. And secondly, waste become a revenue stream, which is also not that bad. So, so that is what's going on today, and there's several water utilities in Denmark that is actually, you can say, more than energy neutral. They're delivering energy back to the net. Yeah. Another thing in what's possible uh, three years from now, um, again, if you want to control the revenue stream, you need a meter, and you need a meter that is doable, uh, even though that you can say the water quality is different uh, from area to area. These sensors, what we are working on research and development is to make these sensors 1,000 times as, uh, you can say, uh, uh, measuring 1,000 time, 1, times more detailed on what's going on in the water. And when we are at that level, we can actually inform about any changes in the water quality. Now, that is something that we need to make people trust that they can drink tap water, because that's another issue with pollution is, in a lot of areas, you don't drink tap water. You drink bottled water, even though bottled water is actually not a, you can say, safe way to transport water. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not without bacteria to do it that way. But of course, if you do not have any certainty and if you do not have any tradition that you can drink water directly from the tap, people will not change their behavior until they get some kind of confirmation that this is okay to do. So I would, I would expect three years from now that technology is available and you can say in terms of cost, just going back to the toilet, because if you accept that you have to have a meter anyway, 
mm -hmm. to, to secure invoicing and the revenue stream. What is the additional cost for actually going into a digitalized water infrastructure? And that's actually the same cost as uh, if you go to a toilet on a German Autobahn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 70 cent, euro cent per month, that's the additional cost for building a data network that can utilize those data. And then the return based on experience project uh, or projects already completed is about 25 euros per month. So the return is there. Very interesting. And it comes back to Cecile. And maybe, Cecile, you can explain to us which kind of fertilizer or fuel uh, the system is provided in Waco. <laughs> Your question is embarrassing because for the moment we are not producing uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, reused uh, material. Actually, for the moment, the technology uh, it's at the first step of development and selling. So it's transforming water into uh, urine into water by electrolysis system uh, with two uh, good uh, advantages. Uh, first, it's a low uh, energy consumption, the electrolysis. And second, it kills all, all the pathogens, yeah. all the bacteria. So that was the reason why I chose this technology amongst uh, many of us because uh, we, we, we knew that the, the, the water was clean, 100% clean. I'm not talking about heavy metals, I'm just talking about bacteria. So what we want to do, what we would like to do, coming back to your question, is uh, on, on one hand we have the, the liquid excrement, mostly the urine, going into the electrolysis reactor and turned into clean water. On the other hand, we have the excrement solid, mainly the faces and flush, uh, that are reduced with uh, bacteria. So we have fecal uh, sludge that we have to collect. We would like to dry the fecal sludge and make it uh, as a combustible or a fertilizer. To make a good fertilizer, we need to save the nutrients of this. So at this uh, forum, uh, we have met a company from Luxembourg, actually from France, uh, that is uh, providing a pri uh, Mm, pro probiotics and argil uh, that uh, are killing the pathogen, reducing, uh, um, withholding the pollution and uh, saving all the nutrients that we want to keep. As you said, phosphorus, uh, nitrates, lots of nutrients, we would like to keep it. And we, we would like to start a project in Senegal with ADEM uh, in order to, to, to see how we can reuse and transform this into good combustible or fertilizer. This is very interesting because uh, now in the scope of technology, it seems that we are moving from a very fast eco-chemistry uh, driven uh, ways of innovating to something that is much more dialing with organic solution, microalgas, and uh, new innovative technologies coming from life science. Stena? Yeah, um, that's a very good point. Um, to be honest, I mean, we're talking mostly about treatment plants for the developed markets and um, and we will see investment continue to come in and extraction of materials and so forth but until that happens in some of these emerging markets um, we need to rely also on natural infrastructure because those are very um, uh, you know natural ways of cleaning out uh, treatment you know to help us with illnesses and pollution and so forth so there's something to be said about investing in natural infrastructure if you are coming from one of these emerging uh, markets um, and also there's a lot of livelihood i mean the ecosystems mangroves i mean there's there's so much um, money for the local people by preserving these ecosystems. So let's not forget about that, even though we're talking about technologies. Mm -hmm. Now, also looking in emerging markets, we have to look at the specific <coughs> area. So for example, if we look at Ghana, which is a very big mining uh, country, um, there's a lot of toxic metals coming out of those waters. So you have cobalt and nickel and gold and cadmium and boron and so forth. And if you're able to extract that, there's another revenue stream for a country like uh, like Ghana. So, um, so I guess it's just, again, going back to knowledge and information and seeing what is possible. Um, and, and the other thing I want to bring into that, you have to marry water management and agriculture with these, with these topics when we talk about um, waste treatment and so forth. Because if you're, you know, there, there's this misconception that if I'm going to install drip irrigation, then I'm going to keep pumping my aquifer. But actually, if that happens, you're going to end up um, you're more salt in your aquifer, salinization of 
of your aquifer, destroying it. And uh, so when we look at agriculture too, what, is, what are our crops that we are growing? Are we exporting out our water through virtual water and doing ourselves a disservice? So they have to come in hand in hand. And a lot of the, and going back to these developing countries, we can also use a lot of these materials coming out of, um, coming out of extraction of wastewater for our agriculture as fertilizers and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it's getting the knowledge and the information, we get media and so forth, and linking it together and understanding it in a holistic, systemic process. Um, it's all the more important to point out this question of uh, water footprint that it's becoming to be a more and more important uh, question. And when speaking about water footprint, it's very easy to speak about agricultural techniques, but we shouldn't forget that a device like this one, and it might be that every one of you has one or twice in a pocket, is worth six tons, six metric tons on water to uh, produce. And this is really something that makes us thinking about circular economy in recycling, not only the raw material, but all the technology bits that are inside, so that to make it more efficient uh, later. But you only have one phone, right? <laughs> you, you don't buy three phones, phones and then leave two of them at home. Unfortunately, I'm afraid <laughs> I'm not an example. <laughs> and this is exactly where we can move forward with the circular economy, because the life cycle of this stuff is so short that it's exactly the same that uh, for your free phones. And if we can revamp this on a regular basis, upgrade and upscale this, or any other electronic devices, then there is a strong business opportunities. So, Paul? Yeah, and speaking of those kind of business opportunities and related to technology, uh, uh, one, uh, a couple of areas that, that, that again, that things link up, uh, and if you think about uh, a ship uh, of any size, but you know, particularly a, you know, uh, well, of any size, it's a sort of a microcosm. You've got people living on that that need food, water, and energy, and some of the more sophisticated uh, aspects of, of the modern maritime community, particularly, you know, you think about a cruise ship, you know, they're enormous now with, with a whole village-sized population. There's a lot of technology and innovation going on to create uh, those systems, and fresh water is a highly precious commodity on a ship, uh, and dealing with waste is also a critically important um, process, particularly now that you know, we're, we are thankfully you know, globally regulating what can go be discharged from a ship. And so there's a lot of innovation in terms of both uh, fresh water use and recycling and waste uh, management and recycling and gasification things and all, you know, turning waste to energy. A lot of great technology and innovation that then can be brought back to land and create opportunities, you know, at appropriate scales and, and, and places uh, that will help deal with these, the circularity that we need uh, in, in different other sort of closed communities, be it on a on a, on a, at an island state level or in different parts of archipelagic countries where you have you know, islands that have very limited um, access to resources and, and, and that sort of thing. A second um, connection uh, in terms of the, the sort of sensors, you know, I think you were probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, thinking about needing to monitor the quality of uh, fresh water in a, in a potable, in a drinking water system. But we also, of course, need to monitor water quality in the natural system in terms of the heavy metals and the nutrients, et cetera. And this we also need to do in the marine environment, of course. And to do so uh, increasingly so that we know, you know if there's you know, heavy metals in, in, the, in the, uh, the rivers, you know, is that getting into the, the marine environment and is that getting into uh, marine food chains, et cetera. Uh, and so there's uh, opportunities to, to have economies of scale in that sort of sensor development, creating uh, business opportunities uh, because there's a bigger market. And part of that, we're, we're actively promoting the development of that, that sort of market and that, and that need and opportunity through uh, what we call smart ocean, smart industry. So basically harnessing the use of the, the many, so there's 90,000 merchant vessels out there, there's uh, an estimated 3 million fishing boats, to use more of the, that industry infrastructure, and of course the fixed infrastructure of aquaculture farms and, and wind farms, et cetera, to get more and more companies hosting sensors on those vessels or on those, uh, at those aquaculture facilities so that they can then monitor the water quality as it is also being monitored hopefully more in the, in the river systems. Uh, 
through harnessing all of these industry infrastructure, we can create, again, a bigger market. And that drives technology, investment opportunities, and innovation. Thank you very much. And I now have a difficult job as a moderator to cope uh, with frustration because we're running a bit uh, short of time. And I would have loved to hear uh, and to share with you questions, but uh, all of you uh, are around uh, to further continue the conversation afterwards. And uh, this is uh, very good. I would also have loved to, to uh, and to talk a bit more about the organic techniques, the natural driven solution on which there's a lot to say, the question of water per footprint we've just raised, but it's time now for the conclusive remark of every of you, and if you want, as a conclusion, to propose us a challenge or an action we should do all together in the forthcoming 12 months, uh, it would be great, and then we will have uh, Concluding remarks uh, from uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau. So, Cécile, do you want to start with? No. OK. S <laughs> Stella, do you want to start with? Yes. Access to water is always <laughs> yeah. uh, an emergency. <laughs> well, well, after all this, I hope we, I want to end with a positive note. So, although we're talking about scarcity, we're actually living in a world of abundance. Um, and, and I'm very encouraged because um, what I see is we have the technology out there, we have the money, the investment, the will to, to invest in this. Um, we have some governments coming on board for regulation. What's missing now is bringing all this together. It's a shared, uh, uh, a shared uh, community onto one platform. We need to use all these disruptive technologies, these digital technologies out there in order to monitor, measure, and forecast our, our Earth systems. We don't know if you can't respect, you can't respect something if you don't monitor and measure it. So we have this unprecedented opportunity. I was in Portugal last week, and I've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley lately, and the digital um, technology technologies that can help us are, are so exciting for me and there's little understanding about these ecosystems so let's marry let's marry these digital groups business economics uh, governments and so forth and 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 also the opportunities the indigenous and the civil society who have the experiences on the ground come together and we can create a very positive future we also need to become more aware we need the media to tell a new narrative we need um, disruption we need disruption in this industry and we need transformational leadership like I was saying we have this exciting opportunity with green bonds now. I read an article in the Financial Times yesterday, 95 billion invested in green funds just this year alone. So th there's this world is coming around us ready to act. So let's be those, th let's act now. And, and the way I see it is that, you know, today has been a gift to us and let's, um, let's make our future a gift to, to future generations. So thank you very much. Very nice words. Paul? That I would uh, echo and support all of that. And and, um, and say then uh, to, uh, to focus on what, what we will be working on and sort of operationalize some of that, to, uh, that we will be working um, and have made a commitment uh, at the UN Ocean Conference uh, and elsewhere to start bringing together this sort of source to sea coalition. So getting the, as I said, the freshwater sector, the, the waste management sector, the, the industries that create um, land use and consumer use issues that, that end up in the water cycle and in the ocean, and really bringing that along with our constituency, the, the ocean business community, bringing that sort of water cycle coalition together from a business point of view to create a leadership alliance around um, addressing the source to sea challenges uh, as a way to really um, uh, action, create the action necessary and the linkages between the different sectors around a complete sort of water cycle look at uh, at our, um, our water planet. And we will be, um, so we'll be doing that through a series of uh, events that we're organizing uh, next year, uh, leading up to our, and beyond, our, our annual Sustainable Ocean Summit again, uh, as a way to, to help deliver on the, um, the, uh, the linkages and the synergies we're, we're seeing and exploring here. Jasper? Yeah, I would say we have a, a huge challenge ahead of us, but we also have a lot of very attractive opportunities where we don't have to see economy and ecology being enemies. Uh, so knowing this, I think one of the responsibilities we have is let's start at the right places first. Let's start where we get the money back the fastest so we can reinvest. And in order for us to do that, we have to go away from assuming what is the right thing to do to knowing. And facts and digitalization is part of that. 
Cécile yeah. um, So I think, uh, especially in the de developed world, we have to think about the simple, simple things that we are forgetting. Uh, water, sanitation, food, all those things that we, we don't uh, spend so much money on it but that are so important to us. And to see uh, what we can do to, to make this better and better for the next generation. Not to be frightened uh, but by, by all this issue because it's a frightening world but there are so many great things coming and we can see the young generation, lots of ideas, lots of willingness to, to change things. And uh, in one word, I think we should share the issues and the solution between the developing world and the developed world. You say there should not be enemies, uh, ecology and uh, economy. I would say uh, developed countries and developing world should not be foreigners to each other because they have the same issue and they have solution coming from each other. So there are definitely some keywords that we remember of as uh, the director of uh, the NGO uh, Green Cross, ecology, and economy are definitely not enemies, but we are partners and we are serving the social community. We are serving the people in their health and in their day-to-day -day needs and very, that is very important uh, to stay aware of. And second, we are dealing with the agriculture, we are dealing with the people from the ocean. We have to be inclusive, we have to take care of all concerns. Probably we didn't have to, have to go further this, but to talk about uh, the price of carbon, to reintegrate the externalities and uh, the subsidies which were linked to uh, water inside the price, to raise the question of uh, price and values. Indeed, these are some things we are working on uh, and Green Cross, and uh, with this encouragement, we will continue working on the agricultural techniques with the circular economy, the cooperation and education. Thank you, because our gender balance was perfect today, but we have to improve on one thing, it's having some people who are suffering from water scarcity of on a daily basis around the table and specifically the people from Senegal from Ghana uh, you were talking about we have to think about the humankind we have to think about our economies we have to think about our earth staying in proper condition but let's the water cycle and the circular economy great again and now it's time to the concluding remarks for today and I think it's time for the panel to leave and for the people to welcome Jean-Michel Cousteau. Thank you for having us. Great honor to be part of this conference. And I want to, uh, in a very short period of time, I wish I had hours to share the uh, privilege that I've had since my father pushed me overboard when I was seven years of age and became a scuba diver. I'm celebrating 71 years of scuba diving, so you know my age. And I will never stop. I will uh, continue until uh, I'm being taken away. We're living a very exciting time, and that is what I call the communication revolution, where every human being, 7.5, 7.6 billion people, are connected to each other. I was in India not very long ago, and in a room where uh, people were asking questions to one gentleman who had a computer, and there were 100 people who were asking questions not about India, but about the rest of the planet. We're living a fascinating time, but education is critical. We need to understand that every species, whether it's a plant or an animal above water or below water, is the capital. And we need to manage it like you manage a business and only live off the interests produced by every one of those species. Every time we lose a species, we weaken the system, whether it's on land or in the ocean. I was in the Amazon last week. Thousands of acres of land or creative trees, which are very, very important when you have more species than you have anywhere on land, 
are disappearing right now. We're weakening the system by losing species. Diversity is synonymous of stability. We need to keep that in mind for the rest of our lives. And my conclusion, because I know that we have to move on, and I will be uh, privileged against tonight, but we are at a critical time in our human history. Now, we must become better decision makers. And we can, and we are able to. I'm happy to say that when I sit down with, whether it's president of a country or the president of an organization, an industry, they have a heart, they have a family. Their objectives are short term, but we need to help them make the bridge with the future. And when you never point a finger, but you sit down and have a dialogue, like I've had the privilege with President uh, W. Bush, who is in the oil industry in Texas, and he saw what we saw in the middle of the Pacific when it came to the accumulation of our wastes, which are coming, and I counted 52 different countries, including France, in the middle of thousands of miles away from other Japan or Canada or the US. He was blown away and he decided to protect the largest pieces of ocean that anybody has ever done. And President Obama last year in September at a big conference we had in Honolulu, he came and he flew and saw what the president Bush had done, and he multiplied what he did by four times. It's the biggest protected piece of ocean today. And he has airplanes flying to catch up people who are illegally fishing and making sure that there are volunteers who are going there picking up tons and tons of abandoned fishing nets which are destroying the coral reefs, killing all kinds of creatures. And all of that is being recycled and creating energy in Honolulu. There are all kinds of solutions today. And reaching out to the young people who are the decision makers, they will not have the same difficulties that we have. We must realize that our lives and futures are connected, not only to this planet, but to one another, to every one of us. We all breathe the same air, drink from the same water cycle, and depend on the same water planet to sustain us. We are the only species on the planet that has the privilege to decide not to disappear. It's a choice which I believe, and otherwise I wouldn't be here, I would be out there trying to catch the last fish in the ocean that we have. So I believe we are heading in that direction. And this is why this conference and these people are so critical to what we are deciding. Well, it is our choice. It is time for us to change, to come together in our compassion and cooperation and make much better decisions to solve the challenges of climate change ahead. Our future and the future of those we love depend on the decisions we make today. Thank you very much. I have the privilege of being part of Green Cross with a lot of respect for President Gorbachev and uh, also the company I created for honoring my father's philosophy after he passed away. And you will find, if you want to, out there, the little bit of our solutions with Ocean Keys to Act. You have questions? You think you have questions now?
Uh oh, you're being kicked out, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna say yes, yeah. but we have time for a question. Yes, yes. You're running it. <laughs> it's your problem. First, I, I'm from the Philippines, and thank you for this forum and for Mr. Costo, because we had the privilege of meeting his father in Palawan, and we brought him with his shoots to the president at that time. And since that time up to now, we have really been trying to care for the ocean, but would like to enter and we hope to get your help because uh, besides the pollution of the ocean, there is the danger of war. In the Philippines right now, uh, there is the conflict, the aggression, and we hope uh, as an artist, we're in, in the Earth Savers, we're UNESCO Artists for Peace. We hope that a music theater peace concert of artists from the claimant countries can become a cultural diplomatic initiative to lower the aggression and the confrontation and prevent war. Uh, war and all the bombs give you more carbon. So we hope that <laughs> if we have this force with us, we're planning this in, in March in order to celebrate women, water, and world theater. The artists are your partners to communicate in cultural symbols people understand. We're doing a soap opera and we're going to get all your words into it in our language, in characters and conditions our people can understand. We just, I'm just so excited and hope that since your dad was in the Philippines, we may source your creative energy to help this mission in March. Thank you. Thank you very much. It may be very important to state that uh, what we stand for when we stand for a better climate and a safe environment is definitively the question of peace and the question of humankind as a whole being able to gather. And there has been for this a declaration called the Declaration of Rights and Duties of Humankind that has been updated and proposed by the civil societies at COP21. This may be a text of interest and the involvement of artists, of people from the civil society who have the ability to talk not only to ecologists, but to the 80% of the citizen who don't care about ecology, but who cares about living on a safe planet and being able to talk about their future. These peoples, you, are very important to us. So thank you for this message. Next. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Gusto, thank you, panel. Um, it's amazing what you're all doing. So um, I'm thrilled to learn that you have the same charisma and mobilization bio as your father had. And he was the first ocean activist, and he was the first guy having this ocean uh, reef protected. And I, is that right? Can you uh, tell me what the presidents did now? That's uh, breaking news. And. Uh, not Trump, no, not Trump, ma'am. Um, what um, Bush did and what Obama did and the mobilization power of, of your uh, big name. And you also mentioned um, it's the first time in history we all connected to each other. Um, uh, maybe you can give me as a journalist a little bit of briefing what we could do to uh, basically um, to spread a message of super celebrities like you and all the other extremely important messages you all have, so what we can do to help. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I want to make sure that uh, these very creative people and very important people can answer your question as well. My uh, quick answer is to never point a finger, never accuse. Try to have a dialogue, which I've had the privilege in many parts of the world, in Brazil, uh, with the uh, creation of uh, the, uh, one of the most dangerous uh, uh, 
chemical company uh, and they've changed by starting to use the waste of the um, sugar industry, uh, which comes from the cans that are left behind and being burned. Well, instead of burning it, they recover it and they create new uh, products without any oil and very successfully. I've done the same thing with the president of uh, uh, Mexico at the time, uh, President Zedillo. I knew he was a diver. Uh -uh. <laughs> and, and I said, I wish there were more decision makers who were divers because they would understand that w we don't know the thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of species in the ocean which we don't know. How can you protect them? How can you protect what you don't understand? And that's why now I'm certified with the exosuit, which was created by an amazing gentleman, Phil Newton, up in Canada, which allows me to go into that suit where I can move like I'm moving now, protected from the pressure, disconnected from the surface, and I can go down to 300 meters, 1,000 feet, spend 10 hours down there with a high definition camera, LED lights on my tummy, with my right leg I go forward, back, left, right, with my left leg I go up and down, and I can tick up samples with my repeated mechanical fingers for the scientific community. I can even move my leg, adjust the air that I breathe to make sure it's recycled. I can pick my nose if I want to. I mean, this is where we're gonna be able to help discover thousands of new species, which we all depend upon, which we need to protect. So we're living a very, very exciting time. And as I mentioned earlier, thanks to the communication revolution, where we can accuse those stupid cell phones, I have one, you know, and the cost that it makes to do that and the water they did consume, but it has connected us, all the human species. And because of that, now we know all the mistakes we have made and we can sit down with our decision makers and help them make better decisions.